Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Matt Williamson. Matt's the Director of Engineering at ADF and has over 30 years of process engineering and project management experience. Matt is an expert in dust mitigation and has conducted over 100 DHAs for various industries. He's also been published multiple times in magazines, has been a recurring guest on the Dust Safety Science Podcast, and is an internationally recognized expert on combustible dust and related regulations. As a leader here at ADF Engineering, Matt guides a team of engineers on a variety of process development and improvement projects in the food, feed, bioscience, and consumer product industries. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Matt for today's presentation. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so today, uh, the topic of this presentation is uh, changes that are upcoming to the combustible dust standards, uh, initially just spelled out as changes to uh, NFPA 652, but that's not really true. Uh, it, we're, they're not actually changing NFPA 652. They are replacing NFPA 652. Uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the background of that, why that is happening, and uh, what it is changing to. So first, a little background on uh, combustible dust regulations, why they've come about, how they've come about, uh, have they been effective and uh, what are they becoming and what does that imply for the future in combustible dusts? So first of all, why do we need a standard for combustible dust safety? That's the first thing we'll uh, we'll discuss. So combustible dust explosions have been incur occurring for a long time uh, as as long as, as human history, we've had uh, it, incidents of combustible dust that have been uh, known throughout history. Uh, some of the most significant ones in the modern industrial age occurring back even to the 19th century, uh, where a mill at uh, General Mills in, uh, in Arizona had quite a massive explosion that uh, led to a number of cha changes, including the uh, the invention of the dust collector uh, as, as a result of that combustible dust explosion. So it has long been a leading cause of multi-fatality incidents throughout industry. And of course, we all know about the major event that occurred in 2008 uh, in Savannah at the Imperial Sugar Facility. Uh, you see a picture of it here. A uh, very hey, Matt, well documented Matt, event. Yes. I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, I am not seeing your slides advance on my end. Oh, really? Yep. No movement at all? Uh, not on my end. Is everyone else seeing the title slide? Oh, I'm three slides in. Okay, let me there escape. You okay, you see that? I do, yep. All right. Okay, well, it looks like back it's... In. Uh, I apologize. It might just be on my end. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Thanks, can everyone. Can everyone see background? Can you see background and updates to yep. dust regulations? Okay. Great. So right. sorry about that. Um, so first of all, why do we need a standard for combustible dusts? How do? Uh, how was this developed? Has it been effective? Uh, why is it being replaced? And what does that mean? So uh, here I was talking about Imperial Sugar. Uh, Tim, you can see this. Uh, yes, I can. Great. So we all know about the event that occurred in Savannah in 2008, and there's a lot of misconception that this event led to these changes and toward the implementation of the standard that became NFPA 652. That is actually not true because the NEP uh, the National Emphasis Program that was issued by OSHA was actually done in 2007. It was some four months before the Savannah Imperial Sugar explosion occurred. So OSHA was already going down this path. And then when that event occurred, that became an accelerating event that uh, that brought a national attention to this and elevated the the need for this standard. It was by no means the largest or deadliest uh, combustible dust explosion, even in the United States, much less the world. 
Uh, in fact, there was a, a there were 14 people that unfortunately lost their lives in Savannah in 2008. But going back uh, only as far as 1978 in West Wego, Louisiana, uh, there was an incident involving a, uh, a a bank of corn concrete silos that had an explosion where a silo fell over and killed 32 people. A much, much bigger event. So this has been going on for some time. This is not a new phenomenon. So uh, at this time, when OSHA came out with the NEP, the NFPA already had a number of specific industrial standards. Unfortunately, they were all very inconsistent with what they required and what one industry required was very different from what another industry required. For instance, the plastics industry was uh, was very, very strict, but it may not have been not as strict, say, over in the woodworking industry. But these events, these these combustible dust events are very, very similar occurrences with a lot of very, very similar requirements and risks. So OSHA's intent uh, was to develop a standard to duplicate the, th the success that they had had back going back to the, the early 90s with process safety management, PSM. And PSM was a standard that they had, they had developed to mitigate and manage uh, flammable liquids and vapors, and it was an overwhelming success. It worked very, very well. There have certainly been incidents with flammable vapors and liquids, but you don't hear as many of those big um, events making the news like you hear combustible dusts. They certainly don't have that kind of frequency. So the core element of this that they really wanted to capture was the process hazard analysis. And they took the idea of doing a process hazard analysis and converted that into the concept of making a dust hazard analysis, which is the key new concept that was really introduced by NFPA 652. And this is a requirement uh, for all facilities. They made it retroactive. There's, there's no way around it. You've got to get this done if you're handling, handling any kind of potentially combustible materials on your site. It isn't quite the same as, as a PHA, but it's very, very similar. The difference here is you're not dealing with uh, a lot of the exact same hazards, and there's not a lot of difference in terms of the um, that that level of risk, that level of danger, because it's pretty consistent and it doesn't differentiate priorities very well on a dust hazard analysis as well as it does in a PHA. So it's just organized quite a bit differently. So OSHA recognized that they needed help, that it was just beyond their capability as a government agency. They needed expertise. They leaned on the private sector and they went to right back to NFPA who had all of those um, disparate uh, standards from across several different industries and ask them to create an umbrella standard that would cover all industries. And that's how NFPA 652 came into being. So this was finally issued as the standard on, of the fundamentals of combustible dust in, to develop common language and common concepts to require that DHA. This was issued in 2015. Initially, they gave industry three years to get a dust hazard analysis done. Of course, by that three years later, industry was just waking up to the idea that this standard had even been issued. So of course that hadn't been done. They then extended it two more years into 2020, and we all know what we were doing in 2020. Nothing was getting done during COVID. So that deadline came and went, and still the majority of companies out there had not gotten their DHAs done. So even today, now in, in 2024, we still have DHAs occurring for the first time like it's a surprise 
to a big part of the industry, so the word is still getting out there. So what does a DHA do for you? It tells you what hazards you have on your site. It defines the level of risk, where those priorities are. It defines the safe operating ranges and what protections are needed. What it does not do is it does not give you specifics. How do you fix those problems? What are your options? What is the best option? Is it better to put in an explosion panel or a chemical suppression system? What is it going to cost to fix them? Of course, a DHA isn't going to tell you that. It's just going to tell you that you have to fix it. So you need to take these things to the next step and you need to develop an implementation plan based on what's going to be easiest to implement, get that low hanging fruit, go fix the grounding and bonding is usually one of the first things that occurs before we start implementing any capital fixes. So here's some new data. Uh, this comes from Dust Safety Science. In the past three years, there have been almost $4 million issued in OSHA fines, in OSHA penalties in uh, 2021 through 2023. And as you can see here, the number, uh, not only have the number of citations gone way, way up, from around 50 to over 200 in the past three years. The penalties have gone from less than half a million dollars. Now they've, in the last year, they collected over $2 million in citations uh, from industry. So this has, this has seen a tremendous surge. So these things are definitely waking up industry to the, the fact that, hey, you've got to get your DHA done. You've got to do these things. Um, because OSHA is absolutely out there. Has this been effective? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, it has been effective. Uh, ha they may not have seen the exactly the same kind of sudden change they saw with process safety management because it's taken a little longer to get, I believe, the word out. So um, here you'll see on this chart, you've got uh, one spike in there which uh, I believe corresponds with uh, the Didion milling incident, which uh, the report for that has recently come come out. If you have not seen that, that's available. It's a very interesting, uh, interesting piece of material. But the number of explosions and the number of fatalities related to those explosions have dropped sharply in the past several years since 652 was issued. Where are these explosions occurring? Well, the main industry where these things occur, which is the area where OSHA is very much focusing, is in agricultural and food products. Food products in this case is including sugar, because we all remember Imperial Sugar. Uh, well, those incidents still are occurring. And agricultural food products, these are the areas that are getting a lot of attention. Right after that would be wood products. So especially if you are making uh, cabinetry or doors, things like that out of uh, in a wood shop uh, and you're dealing with with dry woods and you're accumulating sawdust, this is another area where there have been a lot of lo a lot of incidents, a lot of fires in the past several years, in fact. So uh, within the plant, what type of equipment is this occurring in? Well, you'll we all know that the dust collector is a place where uh, the dusts are accumulated and the hazard is accumulated, but we can prepare for that in a dust collector. It's a little tougher when you start running into the storage silos, which you'll actually see is the number one place where events occur. It's actually been in storage and silos, uh, but also going back into dryers, especially those grain dryers. Uh, are very, very susceptible to fires. So explosions are still occurring. Uh, 652 has been effective, but it's not done yet. The, there you'll see a picture of Didion over on the right. Uh, over on the left, you see a bank of concrete silos. This is an area where I've spoken at, uh, at a number of events talking about concrete silos and how to protect concrete silos. Um, like I say, it's one. It's the area where the greatest incidence is actually occurring is in the silos. 
So here's a neat little video from someone's dash cam. Uh, this occurred over in Europe. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing that uh, that they caught this on their dash cam. You see some photos that were taken afterward. Uh, so hopefully that's coming through clearly. Um, ac across the uh, across the call. So um, and, yeah, you see that one big piece flying off in the distance. Uh, just be glad we nobody was standing under that flying around. So if you have completed your DHA, what do you do now? Uh, well, in it, NFPA 652 requires DHAs to be updated every five years. You need to main maintain a management of change program for your DHAs. So if you make changes to your dust handling process, if you bring in new materials, well, then you need to update that just like a management of change that came from process safety management. Um, if uh, you're conducting uh, your DHAs in house, you may want to consider some outside expertise uh, to come and help you with with some of these things and provide some some ideas from other industries uh, and from some other areas. So uh, you do need to show if OSHA comes in that you've made progress on your implementation plan from your DHA. You can't just do a DHA, file it away and say, oh yeah, we've got a DHA. You've got to do something with it. So those regulatory requirements also keep in mind, they're only going to get tougher. So then why is NFPA 652 being replaced? And what is it being replaced with? It's being replaced with a new standard. It's going to be called NFPA 660. 660 is combustible dust code. And where do they get that from? Any, if there are any electricians on the call, any electrical engineers, you're familiar with National Electrical Code. And how did that get developed? That started as NFPA 70 and it became 70E. And now we all know NEC is the National Electrical Code. This is the new combustible dust code. And it's got that word code in it which uh, is certainly frightening, uh, but it means something. It doesn't mean that it will be uh, law on the day that it is issued. On the day that it is issued, it's issued as another NFPA standard, but by consolidating, and that's what they're really doing, they're taking 652 and they're taking 61, 484, 664, 654. These are the industry specific standards and they're rolling them all into one. Why are they doing that? What's the value of doing that? The value of doing that for one is to make sure that that dusts are treated consistently across multiple industries. But the other thing that this is doing uh, most importantly is it's going to make it easier for states to adopt this standard as code. And when that happens, they'll be able to legislate it directly. They'll be able to OSHA will be able to charge directly instead of using the general duty clause. So that's really one of the motivations behind this. Are there any changes to these codes? That's the other big question. So the way 660 is set up is all of these old codes are going to be chapters in the new 660. So there's going to be a chapter that used to be NFPA 61 used to be an entire code. Now it's a chapter of the new code. Uh, it's same with same with woodworking, for example, and then uh, they'll all be more readily able to reference the same general dust hazard uh, standards. So will that change anything? Well, yes. Uh, a number of things, as I mentioned, will be more strict and some of the exemptions that some industries had enjoyed for some period of time, particularly the food industry, uh, are going to be subject to some of the stricter standards that you may find over in plastics, for example. And that's going to uh, take away a lot of those exemptions. When that happens, there there could be capital implications. There could be a number of implications. And I, we can't say exactly what that's going to be at this point. So NFPA 660 has been out for public review. Uh, that, that ended last year. 
so it's gone back there editing. Uh, so um, when is all this happening? As I mentioned, the public review period ended last year. It is scheduled to be issued this year. However, uh, those of us uh, close to the industry um, are hearing an awful lot of pushback. And that put that amount of pushback from that high of a level is telling us that eh, more than likely this is not going to come out this year. There is a very, very good chance that this is going to be delayed. Can I say that for sure? No. But the likelihood is uh, definitely strong that uh, that this could push back uh, 